It is June 1st, 2023, just a little bit before 4 p.m. I got an email some weeks ago from a mysterious Mexican <laughs> who is using an alias here, although mm -hmm. his first name, I guess, is correct, uh, Hernan. Yes. Uh, yep. Hernan Saliado. And yep. uh, I guess before you have a bunch of questions to talk with me about for a few hours, um, let me just ask you what I ask other people who have done uh, similar shows with me. Uh, so where did you first hear about Cosmoetica and uh, so forth? And uh, what uh, prompted you to contact me? Okay, so my, my very first um, very first interaction with you or the first time I saw you was I was on YouTube. And you know YouTube has this feature where they suggest videos to you. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, they were suggesting a video where you were talking uh, crap about David Foster Wallace, uh. who, who's an author that I actually like. Um, so I thought it was funny. The, the first time I clicked on it, I was like, who is this guy? Like, I was pissed because I was like, how can someone be trashing David Foster Wallace? So I clicked on it and I heard it and I thought it was interesting. Honestly, I was like, no, this guy, Dan, is, is, is very interesting and he's smart. So I just went basically down the rabbit hole and I just started watching all the videos, you know, a lot of videos. And I was like, wow, this is this is amazing. And through there, I went on Cosmoetica. And then I watched another video that I watched that really impacted me was a Ed Gein Becoming video. Uh -huh. I watched the whole thing and it was fascinating to me. And I, I really like the intro where it says. I don't know who made that, but it's, it, I think it was really well done that it says, imagine if you were able to look at Picasso while he was making one of his paintings or Stanley Kubrick while he was making one of his movies. This is the similar thing. You're watching a poet as he creates a poem, you know? So that really caught me, uh, my, my attention and I watched the whole video and I thought it was fascinating. Okay. And, and yeah, that's basically it. So I went into Cosmoetica and I started just reading everything I could. So Hernan, and so the H is silent. Hernan, a um, couple of questions I would then ask is, um, when you say that you like David Foster Wallace, uh, if you've seen enough videos or read enough of my stuff, you know, I don't really talk about what I like and dislike. There are things yeah. I dislike that I that that uh, I recognize are good, and there are things that I like that I know a bit. When you say that you like David Foster Wallace, is that in the past tense, or do you still like David Foster Wallace's writing? And, and is that different from realizing that it's not particularly good writing? Yeah, so David Foster Wallace, I have Infinite Jest and I have his first novel, The Broom of the System, mm -hmm. both of which I have not really gotten into. I haven't read his novels. What I've read more of his are his articles that he's, that he's done mm -hmm. and some of his short stories. I think are well written when I read him I am um, very impressed by how he writes, by the amount of detail he goes into, and I find them very funny. I laugh when I read his writing. Really? Uh, I mean, I mean uh, that's one of the things when I've read his stuff, it's, it's like, uh, you know, a 13-year-old boy, you know, playing with his dick and laughing. I mean, it says to me so immature. Have have you what, what have have you read his short stories or just the novels? I've read the short stories. I I I, I think he's got two short story collections. I read a book that he wrote, a science book where he wrote the the text accompanying it. I read Infinite Jest. I read parts of Broom of the System. Um, what was the, there was a the last one that he that they published Pale, after his Pale death? King. I read Pale King. Yeah, the, the Pale, Pale King. Um, it's. It's a, what what other writers then do you do you read? Um, I'm trying to think of some of the bad right like Dave Eggers. Do you like Dave Eggers too? No, I've never read Dave Eggers. Hmm. Um, and I'm going to tell you something about Dave Foster Wallace. Also, that's interesting. When I read his books, I this this is going to be this is going to sound strange, but I get the feeling that I get when I'm on an acid trip, where where there's seriously where there's like a lot of attention to details. There are some details that David Foster Wallace. Uh, describes that I would only notice if I was on an acid. So maybe I have something to do with that, but that's what, that's what I feel like, honestly. And yeah, I find it funny. Like I do, I, I laugh at, at some of his, like there's a short story called Good Old Neon. Have you read that one? If it's in one of his short story collections, I did years ago, but I don't even know if I, 
I think I have Infinite Jest. I don't know if I kept. Uh, I downsized a lot of our books a few years ago. With people like him that uh, I, I just I'm never going to read it again. So, which one thing I found interesting was that story. Um, good old Neon is about a, a man who realizes that he's a fraud, and he ends up killing himself in the story. And I heard you talk about David Foster Wallace saying he probably realized he was a fraud, and that's why he killed himself. And I thought it was interesting because in that short story, that's exactly what happens. A man realizes that he's a fraud, and he and he actually kills himself. And that's the last story he wrote before he killed himself. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's something there that of, of what you said. Yeah. I mean, you know, and I should say when I talk about uh, bad writers and I, I or bad artists, when I criticize Steven Spielberg or Maya Angelou or David Foster Wallace or other poets or, or whatnot, I, I've never said that. Uh, I'm, I, I'm happy that uh, these people are, are bad artists or that David Foster Wallace what? killed himself. Um, yeah, no. You know, it's, it's, it's nothing personal. Uh, you know, if I had met him, I would have said, listen, dude, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, you're going to be forgotten in 50 years because yeah. the, the juvenile stuff that you're writing. I mean, have you ever read Don Quixote, for example? I've read parts of it. I've read parts Cervantes, of it. Cervantes, 400 years ago, his humor still stands. Uh, and, and that's an amazing thing because he, he actually spans from low toilet humor to, to a very sophisticated humor that's still funny today, which is different than, you know, his contemporary William Shakespeare. Shakespeare's stuff, I, I've said too, Shakespeare was terrible writing yeah. comedy. I'm writing a comedy right now, a play I'm finishing up in a day or two on uh, uh, the Roman Empire and Emperor, Emperor Justinian. Uh, uh, now called the Byzantine Empire, when Constantinople was being plagued by this whale called Porphyrios. And in doing it, I, 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 it was something that uh, I had years ago heard about, and then I, I just came across it online. I was like, I got to do a play about that. But I had to do it as a comedy. And so basically, uh, it, it's basically a, about the uh, Justinian, uh, Justinian the Great, uh, worrying about his standing in the community of the enemies of uh, the empire uh, because they can't uh, kill this whale that terrorized uh, the whole Greece-Turkey area for 50 years sinking ships. I mean, this was a real-life Moby Dick 1,500 years ago. and But it, I had to do it as a comedy because it, it, it's so bizarre and absurd. Um, and I was just thinking the earlier, uh, well, a few days ago, after one of our emails, uh, uh, how all art uh, is uh, has two components to it. Um, uh, there's ideation, coming up with the idea for something, and mm -hmm. then there's the execution, how you do it. Mm -hmm. And with with me, someone like David Foster Wallace failed in both counts. There's a guy who writes for Alex. Have you seen Alex Sheremetz's Sher website? Yes, I, I've, I've emailed him also. Okay, yes, but... Ezekiel Yu uh, is a, a young writer there. And he's been writing some good reviews. He recently, or just a day or two ago, put up a short story that wasn't nearly as good as, as, as the memoirs and the criticism that he's written. Uh, and it's one of those things that, because he was writing about prostitutes and he was writing in a such a conventional way, the ideation, the idea of a short story about a couple of Johns uh, going to a prostitute was, was not new, but it wasn't... It, it was not even put in a good way. So uh, mm. for me, when when something fails, uh, there's it can fail in one, the other, or in both ways. So there's three ways that something can fail. Um, mm. And uh, anyway, that's that, that's just a thought that there, came to my mind. There's there's one uh, in particular, David Foster Wallace. There's a, a thing he wrote about the the horrors of of, of uh, cruise ships. I'm not sure if you've read that. The horrors of cruise ships. So a magazine paid him money to go on a cruise ship and write an article about it. Mm -hmm. And that one in particular, I think, is extremely funny. I find it really funny because I've been on cruise ships, you know, and some of his observations are, are hilarious, honestly. Like, I, I really, I had never read someone describe things like that. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm not standing up for him or anything. I'm just saying. No, I, you, 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 you have your right to your own opinion. I mean, uh, uh, and... and I don't think I've mentioned. So you, you yourself, what what type of art do you do? For most of my life, I've been doing music. Mm -hmm. Mostly songwriting is what I I would say my strength. 
is I was in a lot of bands. I was never good technically on my instrument. I played the guitar. Uh, I was never the best, but I would I would always be accepted into bands because I could write songs. So I would write the songs and play rhythm guitar while the rest of the musicians would be more more good at their instruments, you know? So And, and, and so just looking at your background, you said that uh, you are a property owner. You inherited some property. Uh, you live in, yeah. in northern Mexico. Uh, so do you is that an artist studio that you have in, in the back? This is just my room. I, I live I live with my family in a big compound and I have like my own little space, my own little sort of building place. Uh. Yeah, this is my room, but also where I work. So all, all the, the walls are uh, written and I have my canvases here and stuff. I also make collages and I, and I paint and so, stuff. So what is your goal? Uh, do you see yourself as a visual artist? Uh, if, if a visual artist, because like I mentioned that uh, Alex uh, is going to be doing this documentary on this poet that I, I knew, a, a mm. mentally ill man who was a great poet who died last year, who was a friend of mine. Um, do you do you also do visual stuff? Or? I do visually. I do more collages and I paint. Okay. Mm. And I enjoy doing that. I enjoy doing collages. Um, I like using a lot of words on my collages. I paste a lot of things that I find. Um, I like mixing the mediums. Like uh, I, I can send you some stuff. But on it, but honestly, and I was talking about this in, in therapy. I was telling my therapist how since I discovered how I, I discovered writing and and words in general, and I just find um, I can be more much more specific about what I'm expressing with words. You know. It's, it's it's interesting you just mentioned that because a couple of days ago I found this YouTube website that came up on a playlist I, when I you know listen to something doing my work just background stuff and some, some video comes up this young girl who's autistic who has a website called like on the spectrum or something and I was watching some of her videos and it's just interesting to watch this young girl who only recently found out she was autistic trying to sort of justify or go back in her mind and, 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 and whatnot. And she's talking about words and how things shape and how she sees things differently from the world. Um, uh, is that something that that's like you? I, I mean, I sent an email to see maybe if I could talk, interview her, but uh, uh, from what you just briefly said there, um, is, do you consider yourself uh, in any way uh, neurodivergent? <laughs> so I've been to a lot of psychiatrists slash psychologists in the past I've been diagnosed as different things but honestly I think most of them were kind of just they didn't really know what they were doing the one I'm with right now who I think is the best psychiatrist that I've seen mm -hmm. he tells me that he doesn't think I I have anything you know maybe some HD, ADHD slightly um, but I think that because and I'll be honest here I don't know how much my family will like me talking about this but whatever I have done, I have tried a lot of psychedelics and I have experimented a lot in that way. So, so, do, so is Alex. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so there's some of that. I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm the, there might be something that I don't know, but no, generally speaking, I think I'm, I'm all, I'm like just average, you know. But I, I, I have had a lot of thoughts about words and about images and about music while on psychedelics and just normally, you know. So I don't know. And and just before, I'll just ask one or two more things, and then we'll we'll get to you. You can ask whatever you want. Um, so were you playing in a rock band, or was it pop music, or was it what what were you playing? Yeah, so I was in a rock band, mostly. Um, yeah, it was rock music, kind of heavy rock music. Are but we talking we, Metallica, Slayer? You know, uh, more 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 nineties alternative, I'd say. Okay. But but I like all kinds of music. I like 70s. I like classic rock, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd. I like the 80s, new wave. I like metal. I like the 90s. But I'd say in terms of style, we were we more more like a, a 90s alternative band. You, you know, you you said you want a cruise ships, and Americans have this idea that like Mexico is just a bunch of guys in sombreros going ling, 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 on a cruise ship playing you know Mexican music. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. we we have. It's it's the same thing. Like if, if if you go to go to Scandinavia, what now? People will think you're a bunch of Vikings. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, boom, yeah. Boom. Yeah, no. It's I, I'm honestly in a very uh, unique place here in Mexico because where I live, and I'm not. It's just the truth. It's in all Latin America. This is probably the 
the wealthiest part of all Latin America, not just Mexico. Mm -hmm. So we live in a bubble. We live basically nothing like the rest of Mexico. Uh -huh. And I'm not, you know, that's just the truth. So I don't live like most other people in Mexico live, you know? Well, so, is, is that, does that, do you know, uh, is your ancestry like pure uh, from Spain or is it mixed with mestizo and? Uh... Um, well, like I told you my real last name, there's there's a there's a, a town in Spain that's exactly the same, so okay. I'm probably Spanish, uh -huh. but there's probably some mixed in. I, I would imagine, right? Like yeah. And you said you're what 34, 35? 35. Okay. So having said that, that gotten introduced. Uh, why uh, not? Uh, I'll say uh, one ahead. more thing. Go so I, I was rock music, but then after I broke up with my rock band, I discovered hip hop. Mm -hmm. So I, I fell in love with hip hop with most of my friends did not. So now the music that I make now is I think a mixture between hip hop and rock. And I like collaborating with people that I meet online, mm -hmm. make beats and making music and stuff. So it's not just rock. Like I discovered before I used to hate hip hop, but now I love hip hop. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a, bit, a bit of everything, you know? That's okay. all I wanted to say. So uh, now that I've gotten a little bit about you, the rest, just ask what you want to ask. Okay, cool. Thank you, Dan. So, like I told you before, I'm very, what really interests me is how, I know a little bit about your background from what I've heard. Uh, I believe your first contact with poetry was through Walt Whitman, right? You discovered, you found one of his books. Well, I was, I was looking to, to woo this girl in high school uh, huh. that, that I liked. So I, I went to the local library, got out whatever poetry books, you know, uh, Poetry books sort of like this, yeah. Like uh, if, if if you look here, it'll say, whoops, where do I go? Uh, you can't see it, but it says, you know, the best love poems of the American people. And so it's got stuff from the late 19th century, early 20th century. And here's a book that my mom actually had, Great Poems of the English Language. Uh, wow. This is, whew, this probably goes back to the 1920s. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, so I, I, I looked up that stuff, pulled off, and, when I, you know, I saw Walt Whitman, and I was like, hmm, his stuff was different because it was unrhymed. And uh, I said, you know, uh, he's, he's interesting. And I, as I read it, I knew that I could do something like that and maybe better than that, uh, not at that moment when I was 19, but uh, I knew that eventually I would. And it took me nine years of, of filling up, you know, notebooks, those marble kind of notebooks of poems, probably 20,000 uh, juvenile poems before I wrote my first really great poem. And, and that's what I was, that's what I also wanted to ask you. When you, when you saw the poetry of Walt Whitman, did something click inside you where you said, this is something special? Like, was, was there a moment where you... Initial, well, initially, it was, it was very just uh, pragmatic. Uh, I, I, I said, oh, I can write, I don't have to rhyme. I, I, I did quatrains and, and, and rhyming stuff. But when I saw him after a while, I was like, hmm, this, this is good. It, it, it's more like the way I think. I was mentioning that autistic girl. Uh, I have something, I guess I would call like, you call it synesthesia. When I think of certain years, for example, certain colors come to mind. Like the late 1970s are very dark colors in my mind. When I think back, I, I if I'm if we can imagine a movie, let's say I'm thinking of something when I was 12 or 13, 77 or 78, it's sort of in a brown muted thing. The 1980s were more eye popping and whatnot. Uh, the 90s were a little darker with the grunge stuff. The late 90s, the millennial stuff gets a little bit lighter. And and you know things. If I if I think of a woman that I fucked 30 years ago. Um, mm. One woman might be bathed in yellow in my mind, and another woman, uh, it could, and I'm not talking the skin color, you know, uh, mm. she could be black, white, Chinese, whatever. Uh, there are certain color palettes that that are brought to my mind, and uh, other things too, uh, like that. But uh, so when people talk about neurodivergent, they're always talking about autism or ADHD and things mm. that are negative. But if you're an artist, if mm. you're a great artist, mm. you you are neurodivergent because you don't think like 99.999% of the public. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, my uh, 
I told my therapist, what if I am ADHD? What if I am crazy? And he said, it's fine. Like, <laughs> if, if, even if you are, it's good for you. It works for you. So anyway, um, so, so Walt, getting back to Walt Whitman. So uh, I was actually, I, I, I just bought a Walt Whitman book and I was reading the introduction and they were talking about how he broke some um, patterns of older poetry that had to do with meter and stuff. So was he like the first poet that started uh, making poetry more in a sort of uh, tone that was less less poetic and more sort of like how people talk? He was the first one uh, in America, and he was probably the first one that had any success and lasting success, and he was the most influential. William Blake uh, broke from meter 50 or so years earlier, and but Blake was... Blake was more quote a visionary. He did uh, he did uh, visual art, uh, and you know he was more about uh, uh, classical mythology and classical. He 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 has things like you know uh, 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 what are warnings about certain things. He's got uh, 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 you know. He, it's all about mysticism and whatnot. With mm, Walt yeah. Whitman, it was more about talking about the common man. Uh, the difference between Whitman and, and Blake was there's a famous woodcut, I think, of Blake where you see God sort of, if you, if you know American football, a, mm -hmm. a center leans over and, and hikes the ball through his legs. There's mm -hmm. God sort of like a center down and, <laughs> and shooting rays or something down to the planet Earth. Whereas mm -hmm. Walt Whitman would rhapsodize about you know, a little snake slithering along the ground as people right. walk by. And mm -hmm. so uh, for me, that's always been a key because uh, uh, if you've seen some of the other videos, I've talked about uh, some uh, some movies where people talk about, uh, there's, I, I think, I think it, it's in a movie called Smoke with Harvey Keitel, or it might be in another movie, I, I, I'm not certain, uh, where a character talks about if we could, if we could, really experience existence in its full detail, you wouldn't have to go to the top of Mount Everest to get a high. You could be in a coffee shop looking at a water bug crawling along the floor and be amazed by it because how did that water bug get there? You know, mm -hmm. what, you know, and, and you're looking at it and you're getting these ideas. So this thing, this bug that is basically an automaton you know, is, is just acting 99.9999% on instinct, mm -hmm. doesn't have any free will, and I'm mm -hmm. a believer in free will, mm -hmm. is there, and you're seeing it, and you're getting these ideas, and these things flow out of you. Um, that, to me, that's amazing, because, you know, there could very well be nothing. There could be no universe, no existence, uh, even beyond life, existence. You know, a rock exists. It's not alive, but it exists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, yeah, it, it's it that's the great thing about existence and artists should try to convey something of this do you think that if it wouldn't have been a Walt Whitman book if it would have been a William Blake book you would have connected to it uh like you did I connect with Blake I mean I but, but I, it, I, it, it, it's gonna all I, lead to the same thing you know it all all great art is gonna funnel down it's it imagine imagine <laughs> underneath the ground 100 feet underground there's a cave where there's a treasure trove of great art. Well, all of these great artists are these moles that are making their own little tunnels down there. You could do it in different ways. You know, mm -hmm. Stanley Kubrick does it in a different way than I do. Yeah, Walt yeah. Whitman did it in a different way than uh, Picasso. Yeah, no, but I mean, at, at the age that you discovered him, where you were at your life, was it something about Whitman, or do you think it would have been the same thing if it would have been William Blake at that time? If I had discovered uh, Robinson Jeffers or, or Wallace what? Stevens or Rainer Maria Rilke, yeah. it would have said boom, uh, because yeah. I connect with all of them. It's just Whitman was Whitman was, was the first guy with the book there. So then you discover Whitman, and the first thing you did was you tried to imitate him. Was that how you started? Because I want to know, how, like, like literally, what was the first step that you took in, on, on your well, when I fr the first poem I wrote for this girl that I mentioned uh, was <laughs> Quatrains, uh, and it was a poem called A Chance, and it was like 28, 30 Quatrains about, you know, oh, you're so wonderful, wonderful, why don't you, and I was I was doing the whole anonymous 
uh, thing and of I'm, sending her flowers and whatnot. But what, what trains? What is quad trains? That their four line stanzas that rhyme. They can be A B A B A B B A whatever. Um, okay. So you know, uh, um, but uh, uh, so I, I did that, and uh, probably a year or so went by. Uh, uh, the, it didn't work. My pursuit of the girl did not work. Uh, it's one of the more comic uh, moments of my life when she, when I actually encountered her, and she basically blew me off and other things. But uh, um, you know that that uh, gave way around that time. I, I was like, well, I could have given up poetry because I didn't get the girl. I'd be like, fuck it. But I, I, I said, you know, I'm good at it. When I was a kid, I was good with words. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember being five, six years old, talking with ki kids, having listened to my dad watching the television, hating President Richard Nixon at the time, and I would mm -hmm. be thinking about politics. Or I'd be thinking. I, I used to have these big books of atlas maps of the world. It's like mm -hmm. I, if you, you could put, you know, ninety-nine percent of the countries of the world up on a, a screen, and I'd know it just from the outline of the shape. Because mm -hmm. I, I studied these out, and I'd look up the capital cities and which was the most populous city. And I'd, I'd look up, uh, I, I remember as a kid, uh, looking at the Soviet Union and the Aral Sea, which is, was the sea right next to the Caspian Sea. And now mm -hmm. it's virtually gone. It's one of the great environmental disasters of the 20th century uh, mm -hmm. because they, the, the Soviets diverted water from it and it became this wasteland. I mean, the, this irradiated, I mean, it's something where you could do a horror film. Uh, uh, at the, the death of the RLC. And I've written about that in a couple of books. Uh, in one of my science fiction books, I did a whole chapter on the RLC. But uh, those are the kinds of... I didn't read as much uh, in terms of fiction or, or uh, poetry at all, really, uh, uh, but science books. I remember reading books about uh, uh, stars and, and, and the galaxies and dinosaurs. I had, I had these big books with dinosaurs. Now, the scientifically inaccurate, but uh, I, I was always filling myself with knowledge. Uh, uh, it wasn't until uh, this time when I got into the poetry, I said, you know, I'm pretty good at that. And like I said, I, I, I was good at, uh, in the U.S. There's a thing called doing the dozens or when I was a kid called rank outs where, you know, you'd say, your mother, Dan. And I'd say, oh, yeah, your mother. And we'd go on and, with trading insults. And I could I could destroy the kids my own age. I, I, I'd actually out insult adults at six or seven because mm -hmm. I was smarter and, and they wouldn't know, half the time they wouldn't even know they were being insulted because they didn't know what the fuck the words I was using meant. Uh, and dictionaries, uh, if you see in the back right there, yeah. those yeah. are two dictionaries. Um, huh. uh, I still, uh, on rare occasions, do that rather than Googling because it's going to take longer to look them up. But uh, this one, the one with the more yellowed pages, the bigger one on the bottom, that one I, I used, and that's probably... 45 years old or whatnot. I used to have encyclopedias. 1972, the Funkin Wagnalls World Encyclopedia, like 20 volumes or whatnot. Uh, and I would read and uh, I would read every, I, I probably read through all that. Um, the only other thing that I can recall reading when I was about eight or nine was the Bible. When I read the Bible through one summer, eight or nine, I remember saying to my mom that this is bullshit. I said, I'm not going to church anymore. And I didn't go to church anymore. I said, this is now I did appreciate slightly as a child, the artistic merit of the King James Bible, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm not stupid. Having said that as a child, I, and I've written about it in some of my memoirs, I did have what could be some people would call uh, supernatural or, or, or psi, psi experience or preternatural or, or whatever you want to uh, do that. But in, in retrospect, I think those were just things of a creative mind being restrained, not being able to have an outlet for it. So you, you, you have these dreams and, and you, you sort of reify these dreams as having been real. And I think a lot of people do that. A lot of people do that. Uh, people who have quote unquote uh, experiences with angels or near death experiences, people who see lake monsters or Bigfoot wandering, mm -hmm. uh, people who claim that, uh, you know, there are exciting coincidences that happen in their life where they see God or the Virgin Mary or whatever or not. I think these are, are, are experiences that people don't know how to come to grip with their, their own minor creativity. Right. But you can tell when people, when people claim they're abducted by UFO aliens or they meet 
Jesus or Virgin Mary. It's always the same. And the very fact that these going towards the light kind of experiences are reported the most is not evidence that they're real. It's evidence of the limitations of the creativity of most people who do it. Because I can talk, I could talk, do you know, two or three hours with you just talking about my quote unquote uh, uh, supernatural experiences here or there, and they have similarities, but they are, uh, are different. They, they are turned differently. And as a child, I was not a normal child. Uh, and so uh, you or an average person who, you know, Neil, I, I almost drowned when I was a kid, would have a, a going to the light, seeing God and kind of experience. I didn't have that. But there are some similarities. But my mind went off in a different way. And so that's how I know that these are things that weren't objectively real. They were right. subjectively real at, uh, to me. Uh, and this is why most people who don't have that ability creativity, cre creatively will say, I had a vision. You know, right. John the Apostle came to me or the mm -hmm. Buddha came to me or, yeah. uh, you know, whoever it is, uh, uh, Muhammad or, or whatever. It's probably also a sign of intelligence that you can realize that those things are part of your mind and not some something supernatural. I yeah. think probably. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, if if a UFO did land on a front lawn and the whole town saw it and it abducted me, well, then yeah, clearly that's, that's objectively real. But right. without doing that, I mean, you, you, if you've read books like that, you know, people uh, people claim they were abducted by UFOs from Central Park in New York and mm -hmm. they were experimented on sexually. Well, I mean, you know, that, that that's kind of ridiculous. And it's the same yeah. thing, too, with people who have these false memories. Uh, they, they think that they were abused by someone. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've known people who, uh, when they were young, uh, they had troubled childhoods or whatnot. I, I, there was a woman I once uh, was somewhat involved with who wrote a book about her kind of, I won't get into the detail, experiences. But the thing she wrote about... Uh, when she told them to me, they were obviously fantasies. Decades later, she's claiming they're real, and she's she's mixing and matching things that, when when she's talking about sequences of things that happened, she they're different. And you can tell that she's sort of refining the story in her own mind to justify her own actions, good or bad. Right. Um, and yeah. you have to have that ability to separate the bullshit if you want to be an artist, because an artist, one of the main things about art you're communicating a portion of reality. When I'm writing about a character, or if I'm writing a poem about a moment, watching my next door neighbor's cat the other day had a, had a, a lizard in its mouth. And I was like, oh, that poor lizard. It's such a cute cat, but the cat was a killer. And I told my wife about it, Jessica, and she, she's like, oh, he, he, the cat didn't mean I said, yeah, but you wouldn't feel that way if a hawk came and killed that cat, you know? Because we, we, we are attached to cats, not to lizards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... And that's, that's all something that I want to get into is animals and insects in your work. But I want to get back to, to the quatrains that you were talking about. Did you know that they were quatrains when you were making them? And how did you know? I had the encyclopedia. I looked up poetry. I looked up all that information. So I said, oh, a quatrain. I can do a quatrain. I know how to rhyme. Rhyming is easy. Rhyming well takes time to learn how to, to do it. Um, you, can, you can write about any, anything. One can write about anything. I, I'm just editing this book of that, that man, Bruce Aria, who was mentally ill, uh, and I restored a, a novel of his that was butchered by this vanity subsidy press that he had hired. Uh, and I, I actually have 54 examples of where I reverted the manuscript back to its original state because they, they made such terrible edits, and I show why they're terrible edits. But mm -hmm. that that's, that's something else different, but... Yeah. So, so that's how you figured out what that was because of the encyclopedia. You looked it up. You looked up poetry. I didn't have to figure it out. I read, you know. No, yeah, but like, but you said that that you knew what a quatrain was because you looked it up. Yeah. Okay. It's because I'm just I'm really well. I, I I can't. You have to read. Look at all the books in the back there. You know, yeah, yeah, I, you're not born. You're not born all knowing. I'm not. I'm not all knowing yeah. now. No one can be all knowing. There can only be one omniscient being if there is, or one omnipotent being in the universe, if there is, because if you have two beings, one is going to be greater than the other. And if, if they're equal, then they're not om omnipotent because they can cancel each other out. 
Yeah, no, no, I, I, I agree. I'm just, that's what interests me is how, how did you learn, if you didn't study it um, formally, how, how did you learn so much about poetry? And now I'm starting to- You to read. read. You yeah, read. Yeah, exactly. that's, that's the only way to get it. Because you, you, can, you can read these bullshit books from bad, I mean, if, if you're a bad author, you know, Stephen King wrote a book on writing that I did a video about or whatnot. I'm not going to listen to fucking Stephen King. Now, right. having said that, I think Stephen King is a serviceable writer. He's a better writer than David Foster Wallace. He can at least get some stuff across here and there. Yeah. Having said that, no one's going to know about Stephen King in a hundred years. He'll be a ble he was a famous writer. He was well known. He made millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, whatever the fuck he's made. Right. What has he given back though? Has he given back anything to the arts? No, he wrote this terrible book where basically uh, he he's just giving bad advice uh, about how. You know, oh, you watch these YouTube videos, you know, how to make your fiction more exciting from these young kids who are 25 or 30 years old who are just spewing cliches. And actually, Alex and I and this kid Zeke, Ezekiel are going to do a, a show hopefully in the next month about bad YouTube channels because the amount of bad information that gets out there is just ridiculous. That's why I think something like this is important so people can learn something real about um writing and stuff. And I actually, talking about Stephen King, I used to really like Stephen King, but now I go back and read his stuff and I can't read it. It's, I, I can't stand it, honestly. And I read one of his last novels that he wrote and it's terrible, honestly. It's one well, of the is most... it because he, you don't find him funny like you do Wallace? Because it seems to me that your appreciation for Wallace is more based on the humor, whereas yeah. with, with Stephen King, he's not known for his humor. Um, no, St Stephen King, I, I found his books, I, I would read his books, his earlier books, and I would be engaged, I would be interested, uh, I would be a page turner for me. But the last stuff I wrote from him was just boring. It was boring, the characters were boring, the plot was boring, you know. Um, and I told you that I started reading Charles Dickens, mm. and, and this is something that I wanted also to, to tell you. Comparing Dickens to, to Stephen King, there's a book by Stephen King called The Stand. I don't know if you're aware yes, of it. Yes, I've read that, yeah. And I saw oh, the, the thing, the TV show, 30 years ago or whatever. So The Stand, I like the beginning. I think it's uh, well written, the beginning and the middle. But in the end, the, the last part of the book, the last quarter of the book, I feel like he just winged it. He introduces a bomb into the plot. I don't know if you remember. It blows up, and it blows up half of the characters. Mm. And from there, it all just goes to, goes to like, I, I don't like how it ended. Yeah. So it's inconsistent. I, I think it's inconsistent, the, the writing. And then I read Dickens, and the whole book, I find, is is uh, consistent in, in, the, in the quality of the writing. So I want to ask you, is that a mark, one of the marks of a good author, where they're consistent throughout the whole book, where even if the plot has ups and downs, obviously, but there's a consistency to it, you know? It, it's, it's all good, basically. Well, when you say consistent, it, it, it depends on what you mean. Um, for example, I sent you my own Norwegian in the family. There, yeah. That's a, almost a two and a half million word book. Uh, the first, I think, 1.2 million words are the story. And then we go to a 900,000 word digression where the, one of the main characters, Bit von Reingel, has an acid trip. So you'll like this because it's <laughs> 900,000. He goes and he... he interacts with characters from literature over and over and over and over again in different ways and different mutations. Um, and so there you could say, well, that's not consistent. Well, it is in a sense because that's sort of, to me, the interior depth of the book. Then we get back to the mob story for the last three or 400,000 words. Um, so when, it depends on what you mean by consistent. But yeah, you want to have a, a sort of consistent voice unless you have multiple authors and they have different points of view. This kid, Zeke, who did this story about prostitutes, I, it followed like, I think, three Johns. And I said, one of the things to make, in, instead of all the cliches that you're using here, make it that each of it, each of the sections with the th three Johns is told from their point of views. Maybe one John is, is a scumbag. Another one is paranoid. Another one is shy and introverted and a virgin or something and have them have different voices to, to give something different. Their inconsistency is virtue. And here with art, there are only general principles. You're always gonna be able to break rules, the better you are as an artist. If you're, if you're doing music, for example, and, and uh, let's say you're playing, do you know the song Leonard Skinner's Freebird? 
Yeah. Okay, so you're playing Freebird, and you know there's, what is it, <laughs> eight or nine minutes, over and over and over and over. So you're on stage, and you've done this 40, 50 times on a tour, and you're like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to add a little, you know, Mozart in while I'm doing it. You know, right. the, you're being inconsistent, but it might be good. It depends on the quality that you're doing. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, but, well, yeah, uh, just to clarify, when I mean consistent, I don't mean consistencies in, like, the plot or the style or anything like that. I mean consistent in that it's well-written, you know, it, that there's quality in the writing. Yeah. I, I, That's I, because yeah. King, I, I, I felt a dip in the quality of the writing. Like, he was winging it. Like, like he wrote the, fir the first three parts of the book, very uh into it like he was into it he was excited about it and then it's almost as if he said i just want to finish this already you know and he ended it just w by winging it is what i mean and with dickens i don't feel that at all you know even if the plot has ups and downs there's inconsistencies in the plot you know there's inconsistencies in, in maybe the voices of the characters in other uh, uh other of his books but the quality is is consistent that's, that's yeah what I mean. and, and dickens is a very good writer uh <sighs> Here, here, let me give, give you an example. I would, I would say that Dickens is a more consistent writer than Leo Tolstoy or Dostoevsky. Mm. But is he a greater writer? And this is one of the things I've said before, too, is there's a difference between perfection in art and greatness mm. in art. I, I, I always choose greatness over perfection. I use this example of a poem I did called Congolium Footfalls. It's in that 3,000-plus word PDF I think I sent you. Um, that's that's the depiction of a nightmare, but that's all it is. I mean, I think you could, yeah, you could read into it, but it's a great depiction of a nightmare. But there's nothing deeper. Now that I could argue that's a perfect poem. Is it a great poem? Maybe, you know, I think I rank it as a near great poem. But okay. let's say I'm wrong and I'm underestimating myself and say it's a great poem. But if it's a great poem, that's the more cogent. That's the the better quality to have. Than to be great because you ought to be perfect because you could you could write a perfect little rhyme and it, it, it it's technically if you believe in in poetic meter i don't but you could write a, a a metrically perfect poem it has perfect a b a b rhyme scheme but it's just you know it maybe it's about a little girl walking with her doll it's nothing mm -hmm. deeper mm -hmm. um so when you talk about consistency dickens uh, dickens not dickinson uh uh charles dickens is a very consistent writer. Um, yes, there are better books and worse books, uh, and you know, you know a Dickens character when you hear it just from the the weird names that he's giving these characters. Um, right. uh, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy are far more inconsistent. I mean, you know, War and Peace. Let's face facts. War and Peace. Uh, the the avalanche of names, these Russian names of characters that appear once and then go away. Are, are dull, and he could have gotten rid of that. Now, I would argue that's one of the things that makes Tolstoy Tolstoy, the, this excessive detailing. Um, uh, Dostoevsky, is, even in Crime and Punishment or the Brothers Karamazov, uh, there, there are ups and downs. They're not as c consistently, they, they go up. But when they're on, when Tolstoy, well, especially Dostoevsky, is at his best, his writing is better than Dickens. Uh, than yeah, Dickens. So think think of it if we're on a scale of one to a hundred. All of all of Dickens's stuff never fails. It's at his worst, he's maybe writing at about a sixty-five or seventy. I'm, I'm using the American grading system right. in a school of sixty-five being passable, a hundred being you know great or perfect or whatever. Yeah. So the, the worst Dickens is going to do is a sixty-five or seventy. The best Dickens will get to is maybe a ninety. Mm -hmm. Dostoevsky, on the other hand, he'll ha he'll he'll drop into the forties. You know, he'll have he'll he'll you know if you're looking like an electrocardiogram, you know, it'll be spiking up and down. Whereas mm -hmm. Dickens is more consistent. The mm -hmm. best of Dostoevsky is going to be better than Dickens, but mm -hmm. overall, Dickens might be the better writer. People right. don't want to say that in this day and age because because Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and Turgenev. All of the Russians were heavily didactic. Their whole ideas about art is improving the species or whatnot. Dickens probably thought that his work could help people. You know, uh, A Christmas Carol is, in a sense, didactic. Um, mm -hmm. But he also had more humor. The, the characters, even when they went over the top, Oliver mm -hmm. Twist, 
the the what what's the the the, the little thief uh, uh, the, the the guy who has the child thievery ring in one of the books um uh, all of them uh, they're they're more realistic they're they're exaggerated they're more realistic but you get more of a sense that even with the ups and ups and downs uh, uh, or, or the consistency rather that they that that you know it, it's not going to go as high um so it, it it depends do you want do you want the the uh occasional brilliance of a passage from Di uh, from dostoevsky or do you want the consistency of, of humor and mirth that you get from most of dickens it's right. again it, it so consistency sounds good like you should be uh, qualitatively mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you could argue that Dostoevsky just was incapable of, uh, you know, uh, attaining or, or sustaining that angelic high that's going to make this is art, you know. Uh, whereas Dickens, you know, he he'd be okay. And you also have to understand too. Um, I believe that Dostoevsky and the Russians. I don't. I, I don't think their major works were serialized. I could be wrong about that. You have uh, to. Yeah. So, no. I don't think so. I, yeah, I, I don't think so either. But Dickens wrote Dickens, yeah. in serial, so he had to go have that that consistency to keep mm -hmm. the audience there. Because if right. he had right. two or three bad chapters or dull chapters in a row, uh, this is what people talk about Moby Dick. You know, why do why do we see this stuff with chapters where they're talking about how a fucking whale takes a shit or something? Now. That's not as a standalone chapter. Something like that isn't going to necessarily hold the average reader's interest, especially if you're drinking with your buddies and you're, you're reading this. Because, you know, they had less entertainment than we have today. This is one of the reasons great art is is, is diminished is because there's so much fucking content, YouTube right. content to entertain. So you know, I'm going to whack off to Halle Berry, or I'm going to read a great piece of literature. Most people are going to want to, well, most men at least, and maybe a few lesbians want to whack off to Halle Berry. Right. I, I think also the the serialized form also maybe Dickens could um could get the feedback from the readers and yes, tweak, exactly, and tweak what he was doing. And so right? and so you know if they if if in chapter thirteen they loved that chapter where Pip, you know, right. did this or that, well. By by the time that feedback gets him, I'm all he's already on chapter twenty seven. Maybe I should do another chapter. So chapter thirty is right. has a similar thing to chapter thirteen because right. give the people what they want. Mm -hmm. uh, I read Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky, and I would say it impacted me more uh, oh, psychologically, or, or like as a human and stuff. But then I uh, I read David Copperfield by Dickens, and I was more impressed. <laughs> this is, I was this more is... impressed. By, with with David Copperfield, I was I, I, it, it was amazing to me when I read it. I thought it was amazing, you know. Yeah, with, David with, Copperfield. My my favorite is probably Great Expectations. I read Copperfield and Great Expectations. I remember in junior high, um, mm -hmm. uh, and also I liked uh, the 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 nineteen forties David Lean movie about Great Expectations with the the actress, uh, uh, the great English actress uh, Jean Simmons. I thought mm -hmm. she she's one of the most sexy uh, women ever on on screen. But uh, um, anyway, yeah. Uh, how important do you think it is for someone starting to write poetry to know the basics like meter and jambent, syntax, all that stuff? Is it important for someone to know all of these things when they're starting to write poetry? Well, you got to learn them. Uh, and I've said this many times: you have to learn how to do something. Then, when you're competent. And you can, you know, imagine you're an architect. You have to learn how to draft. You learn have to learn how to actually put the beams and the boards together and whatnot to build a nice little house. Now you want to be a great architect. You don't just don't want to make a, you know a, a nice little house. You want to make a wonderful house, a house that says something. So then you have to unlearn the rules. Uh, I, you know, I'm terrible. For example. Uh, if you were to ask me, or we were to talk about grammar and punctuation and you know participles and this and that, I'm like, I don't. I know 99.9% .9 of the time the correct way to use it, and I, I and I can see something that grammatically, okay, that isn't supposed to work. Uh, mm. it, it doesn't work. Uh, isn't correct. But I couldn't tell you necessarily why. 
you know, that's an object, objectable uh, participle of this, that, that, that. You have to forget that because otherwise you're going to be so weighted down with information that it's like writing a business letter. When I talk about this Bruce Ariel book that I edited, one of the things these bad editors did is they were constantly making corrections and referring to the Chicago Manual of Style. This is an English language book which mm -hmm. basically teaches you how to write a competent fucking business letter. That has nothing to do with creative writing, right? Prose or whatnot. That's like that's like saying you know uh, 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 here uh, you have to learn the first thing you do when you're going to make a film is take the cap off the lens. That doesn't tell you though how right. to fucking make a movie. Right. Yeah, I, I asked because I, like I told you, I, I'm interested in writing poetry. I'm starting to do it, and I just didn't know if I should go and learn. You know the learn but no too if you the difference between writing in english and spanish is spanish is a much more fluid much more mellifluous much nicer sound it's much easier spanish is a much easier language to learn than english and you probably know this because of all of the ways the different sound you know how many times can you have a, a sound and it's spelled six different ways in english it's not that way in spanish uh, it's much easier to write poetry in Spanish. That doesn't mean it's going to be good poetry. And that's one of the reasons that, for example, most Latin American poetry is not particularly good in the last 20th century compared to the English language counterparts. It's because I most of what I read is in English. Most of the art that I consume is in English. Uh -huh. and, I, and I write, it's easier for me to write in English than in Spanish. Yeah. So, so that's why I'm more... So if you're I'm, more at home, then stick with, stick with that. Uh, yeah. But it's going to be harder. I'll, I'll tell you. And so it's going to be harder. But Fish. yes, uh, look look up. Buy you know buy one of those. Uh, I've got somewhere here. You know uh, there, there are uh, books with the rules of poetry. Read through it one summer. This coming summer, if you want to buy, yeah. where the fuck do I have it? Uh, oh here, there we go. Uh, hold on. So. This is about a 25, 30 year old copy, but it's. Okay, can you put it? Okay. The New Princeton Encyclopedia of Poetry and Poetics. Louise okay. Bogan. No, not the new, no, it's not Louise Bogan. Let me see what year this was. This was. So, I mean, this is a, a big book, but, you know, you have to. Okay, 1993, 30 years old. Um, you know, or you can. Or you can get, you know, some other type book, too. For example, uh, let's see. I got this Lewis Turco hit hit. Whoop, there we go. The new book of poetic. Whoops. There we go. The new book of poetic forms, a handbook of poetics. So, mm -hmm. I mean, these are, these are things that you can learn about different metric things. Like I said, one of the first essays I ever did was arguing against poetic meter. There, there, if you listen to me and you were to, to again listen to the way my voice goes up and down as I'm speaking. There isn't I am speaking to or non. There mm -hmm. isn't that up and down on off. The it language and and the rhythms of language are like rolling waves of the sea. They come in and and the musicality, especially in poetry, but also in in prose, comes from the the the. the it's not exact matching rhythms or what, but. And also, too, like if you're doing poetry, if if the character that's speaking is is agitated, you're going to have a lot of short vowel sounds, a lot of K's and G's and kuh, 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 kuh. That's going to be musical if, if it matches the content. If right. I'm talking about, uh, oh my baby, you're so lovely, you know, I want to I want to lick your pussy clean, and I'm going kuh, 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 kuh. that's not yeah. going to that's not going to work. Right, 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 right. No, it's good. It's it's great for me that you showed me those books because I'm gonna get them because yeah, I, I, I had that doubt if if it's important for me to learn these things or not, you know? It's important. Okay. Then I then I will definitely I will definitely read that. I was actually reading your essay, I have it here written down. Hold on. Oh yeah, on on the metric fallacy, the yeah. Robinson Jeffers. Yeah. And that's what you were talking about, what you were saying about. Yeah. Um, so I, I also wanted to ask you specifically about a few things I have here. How do you pronounce, I say Rosario. 
How do you say oh, it? Oh, Rosario, yeah. Rosario. Uh, what can you tell me about about this this book? Uh, that just I, I wrote about 30 poems on, on this Puerto Rican girl character. Uh, and I never really made it a formal sequence until I just put it together a couple of years ago, two or three years ago. Um, uh, Was she I, based on, on a real person? Not really, but I did write this poem in my ju juvenilia. I remember in 86 or 87, I got it. I was living in New York. I got a traffic ticket, had to go to the Brooklyn, Brooklyn traffic court. I remember taking the subway and seeing this beautiful Puerto Rican girl. I remember thinking, God damn, she's... I, I'm not not just hot, but there, there was just something ethereal, like she was an angel. And in my mind, that girl uh, stuck in my mind and became mutated five, ten years later to this character of Rosario that I occasionally wrote poems of, and then I just I just put them all together into a book at, in, in a semi, not in a way where the poems connected up. I don't know if it's really chronological or whatnot. But they're quite different from most of the poems that I've, I've written. Uh, uh, you know, it's not, they're not necessarily striving, they don't have that heart crane, you know, here's, here's the great language or whatnot. They're very simple uh, little settings. I, I was, I was going to say they're, they're different from the Holy Sonnets, from the Omni Sonnets, and from most of what I've read. But there's something special about the Rosario poems, I find. And there's something that, I know, I know you always talk about the difference between something being intellectually or, or mentally good or emotionally good. But one thing I'll say is that the Rosario poems, I feel them more um, emotionally. Okay. They reach me more for, for some reason. I don't know why. Um, yeah. Um, no, no, I was just talking about the, the Rosario, which I, I find emotional for some reason. I don't know why. Um, and beautiful. Uh, so, so going back to, to the beginning, so you say you wrote for nine years, you were writing poetry until you think you, you started writing good poetry. So it's going to take me. 1984, 1993, I wrote my first great poem. I'm not sure which one it was. It might've been something like, uh, another day on the Brooklyn Queens border. It might've been something like my little, uh, free verse sonnet war, which is mm -hmm. about two kids who see who the violence of growing up in New York. Um, uh, uh, it might have been, it, it, it was probably one of those kinds of poems. Uh, I, at the time, too, I wrote a lot of angry young man poems, very much based on beatnik stuff like Allen Ginsberg. Like I got a poem called Necrophilia, which isn't actually about having sex with the dead, but it, it, it's, it's the, the, the necrophilia of the society that thrives on violence. I was in a gang, and so, yeah, you know, I saw, saw lots, of, uh, uh, lots of violence. I, I, I mitigated what I could of it, but... So I'm, I'm 35 right now. I'll probably be 44 until I start making good poetry. You might never. I'll be honest with you. You might never make it. And, and be prepared to fail. But, it, you know, if, if, you, if, you don't, if you're not cut out to be a poet, maybe you're cut out to be a musician or a collagist or, or maybe something will come. Um, and, and maybe you'll just be average at, at that. Uh, but right. it, having an interest in the arts, I was just watching Alex had just done, uh, Alex Sherman had done a video with his fellow Keith, uh, where he's walking in Central Park, and Keith Jackowitz is his name. Uh, he was an actor, uh, tried to be an actor for a little while, and now he's a, a, a nurse in New York City, moved to New York, um, and he married, I guess, a Persian girl, and I hope, I, I haven't spoke with him for a few years, but um, uh, he's someone that still has an interest in the arts. Uh, a lot of times, I, I encounter young people in the arts and and when they don't make it at first and whatnot they give it up and right. they're likely to 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 uh regret that you know you said that you know you you live comfortably in, in one of the wealthiest sections of mexico or whatnot maybe you could be you know maybe you're not a visual maybe you could be an art patron open up a gallery expose you know unknown artists of Mexico, painters. I, I, I honestly don't, don't like doing that, but yeah, I mean, okay. it could. But, but my, my, point, but my point is, if you get frustrated and, you know, yeah, my collages are okay, but nothing new. Uh, my mu I'm solid guitar player, but I'm not going to be Jimmy Page. Uh, right. You know, uh, I, I tried poetry and whatnot, and, you know, it's okay. You know, there are a lot of people 
that could best serve humanity, if you will, by being those who propagate art in others. There was, I, there was this woman I knew years ago in Minneapolis called Laura Winton. She was, she was this obese woman, nice woman. She was, she was not physically attractive, didn't attract males. She wanted to be a writer. She wasn't a good writer. I liked her very much, but I, I always thought, you know, she's killing herself trying to be this artist when she, she hosted poetry readings and, and, and the, she should be one of these facilitators. If you right. want to be in the arts, uh, if she, she had that passion, she didn't have necessarily the money. Maybe, maybe, like I said, you could open up a gallery or, or whatnot. If that, now I'm not saying that this is, you know, five, yeah, 10 years from now, if that doesn't I, work out. I, know? yeah, right now I'm just interested in, in trying it, you know, and I'll try it and we'll see, we'll see what happens, you know? Yeah, um, well, you don't want you don't want to regret not doing something. You know, let me tell I, you something. I was I was just there are a lot of people uh, that I've encountered in the arts. A few years ago, there was this woman who uh, herself isn't an artist, but she has become a self-styled expert in television, American television history. Mm -hmm. And I did a few shows with her, and I, I thought she was a nice woman. Then she started like shit posting a few years ago about men and she was married my wife jessica and i actually met her and her husband and i thought maybe she was going through a bad time that she got divorced or something and you know i i reached out and said you know is everything okay do you do you want to talk personal or whatnot and she, she she's like no no that's fine and then a few months later she wrote something on facebook or wherever it might have been uh about uh this uh soap opera that we both watched and I disagreed with her, and she just went off on me. And I haven't, I haven't, con I haven't been in contact with her since. A similar mm -hmm. thing a couple of years ago. This other woman that I knew uh, and, and interviewed, uh, a terrific songwriter, uh, really talented, wanted to be a poet. I was helping with a poet. She was actually had real talent and and wanna. And then she she had gotten divorced some years ago, and I guess because I was trying to help her, she sees that I'm trying to. Uh, to control her or something, and she, and yeah. she does. so people find excuses to fail. Mm -hmm. um, if you're gonna fail, fail honestly. Don't sabotage yourself. Right, right. Yeah, I. I'm not gonna send you poetry until I, I write something that I think is is good enough. You know, I'm not gonna. Because if it sucks right now, then there's no point. You know. Mm. Um. Another thing that I wanted to ask is. Uh, analyzing poetry, um, appreciating poetry. Is there a particular way to do it? Is there, or, or what's it? everyone? Everyone takes. Is it different for everyone? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like I, I say. People will say, "Well, I'm I, I'm I'm a, a a cis hetero male, blah blah. I'm I'm a a trans woman, blah blah. I, yeah, but you you all shit the same. I mean, yeah. there are certain things." that if we're if if we're science fiction writers well we're writing about science fiction right now there are many different types of science fiction right. but we're not writing love <laughs> you know we're not writing the notebook which was a silly rom-com book or, or right. whatnot that became a movie we're not doing that kind of shit if you're writing horror if you're writing true crime there are certain things that become in any uh, that engender it as a genre but you, you can do it differently you know, like I said, this fellow Zeke, he, he's really a, a good writer. Uh, he, he wrote this this bad short story. And not, I wouldn't say bad, but it wasn't a good short story. You know, mm -hmm. mediocre at best, you could argue. But uh, he's written other stuff. But there's a good example because it's very difficult. Uh, when, when, he wrote a, a terrific little memoir, uh, probably two or three page memoir that Alex posted. That to write about your own life is much simpler than to create a character out of your mind. Now you can create a character that's based upon your aunt or a kid you went to school with or a person you were in business with or whatever it might be. But you're going to have to fictionalize that and, and you're not going to know everything that went on in that person's background. You don't have to necessarily know. You don't have to necessarily reveal that about a character. But if you want to paint a, a, a complex character, you're going, you're going to at least have to create a backstory in your mind so that when when you have a character, let's say if a character is an irredeemable bigot, doesn't like Jews, 
Mm. And the, this character encounters a baker who's Jewish. Well, how is he going to... They're, they're going to... They, he's coming to the baker's shop, and then he finds out he's a Jew. Maybe he's having a good conversation. And he, I'm talking with a Jew. I'm having a good experience with a Jew. And you're going to know how that c comes comes naturally. This is one of the things that uh, I've always... Well, I can't say I've always had... I, I developed it uh, when I talk about the total immersion with some of these big books. Or when I'm doing my plays now is that I, I can write about Justinian the Great 1500 mm. years ago, worrying about a fucking whale terrorizing Constantinople. You know, mm. I, 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 I don't have to, I don't have to know all these details. So often you see writers, you know, well, what, what type of gun did they use in the Mexican American war? Who gives a fuck? Yeah. yeah it yeah, doesn't yeah. really matter. You're talking, but, the, but they'll have all these details. There's a, there's a book called cold mountain that came out 20 or so years ago. Jessica read it. It's about the American civil war. And the writer, I've read parts of it, Jessica read it all. It's it's not terrible, but it's a dull book because she said he has so much about guns. You know, oh, uh, you know, a Winchester 367 or something, describing it, you know, like like the rod. Talk, talk, you know, the, the guy is like jerking off about the shape of a gun or whatnot. Who gives a fuck? You're talking about characters in the middle of a war. Unless, you know... If, if I'm writing about a character and I give him a scar on his face, there has to be a reason that there's a scar. Right. If I'm, if, if, now, it could be just an offhanded thing. Yeah, it's a character that appears in one chapter that the main character meets, and it has a scar, and he won, the main character wonders later, I wonder if that scar came from the war or something. That serves a, a minor purpose. But if, if all you're doing is giving detail, you know, uh, uh, and, and Johnson... Uh, felt felt bad about himself because in the presence of this beautiful woman, he knew that he had a genital wart and he could never consummate it with her, or he would foul her beauty. This kind of stuff is masturbatory bullshit. That and and th this is the kind of exposition that modern uh, MFA uh, uh, masters of fine arts programs here in the U.S. They they want to know, you know they they unpack the story. You know, I feel like I had you know uh, uh, Dan had diarrhea. Unpack the diarrhea. Was the shit green or yellow? What was he suffering from a tumor in his ass, or did he just eat a bad pizza? What the fuck does it matter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, I understand. So, so, so to, to analyze or to appreciate poetry, there's not a single way. It's it's up to the up to the reader. Then it's up to the reader, uh, and you know, someone is going to have different divergent things. You know. Uh, you, you know, you said you appreciate the uh, David Foster Wallace's humor. In ten years, you might not. In ten years, you might say, you know, that was juvenile. Uh, and you may, or, or you may, you may say, you know, I, I thought Dickens uh, was better than Dostoevsky. But then maybe you read something like, uh, uh, no, uh, what's the idiot? Yeah. And and you read the idiot and you say, you know, I've got to reread Dostoevsky. I, I I miss it. I I get the idiot. And maybe it's me that's missing it, and not Dostoevsky. Yeah. Um, in in terms of, of writing, is there, like, for example, music? If I want to get get at the guitar, I have to practice scales. You know, I have to practice my rhythm. I have to. There's a certain certain things that you should practice. With writing, is there something that you would say is is good to practice to to get more skill? Is it just to write? Is it to write and to write and yeah, to write? Yeah. Right. And, that's what editing is for. Write, write, write. You know, uh, there there have been people that I've known that have written bad things. Like I, I, I I've had people who've taken it well, uh, my given them negative uh, feedback. It was good feedback, but it was negative. And there's a difference. Bad criticism. If if you wrote a piece of shit, and I'm saying, Hernan, you're the James Joyce of Mexico. That's bad. And it's a piece of shit. That's bad criticism. Right. If 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 you wrote a, if you wrote something good and I say Anon you 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 go bake cookies, you know that and 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 I'm missing it. That's bad criticism, but there's also good criticism. I, I mentioned one one of these women that I gave some who I was criticizing her, her poetry and and she was coming along great. I think one of the things was he she did have a clunker of a poem and I went into detail about why it didn't work. Some of these people, they just want, you know, they just want to be blown. Uh, some of them just want to 
hear feedback. They're insecure. They're, you know, my, my uncle molested me when I was six. I need to hear good things. I, they don't. You have to have good negative criticism. Look on YouTube. You don't, you rarely see stuff about, oh, you know, the 10, 10 novels people think that are great that are really bad or 10 writers or 10 filmmakers or whatnot. And the few times you do see it, they're doing that bad criticism that, you know, they're looking at 2001 and saying, that's not a good film. There was some asshole that Jessica and I saw a couple of years ago who, who said, 2001, this is the most boring film. Look, there's some fucking lions and then landscape. Oh, there's a cheetah. Landscape. It takes 20 minutes till they get to the moon. What the fuck kind of movie is this? That yeah. guy's an asshole. He's an idiot. You you have to recognize that that kind of, you can't, you know, there's good criticism and there's bad criticism. I give good criticism. Uh, even, even most of the people who might not like me, if you listen to me, and, and you, you said you were turned off initially. That's happened countless times. I've gotten so many emails from people who said, you know, I thought you were a real asshole, Dan. And, and, and what, But, you know, there was something about it. I, I, six months after I first read a couple of your things, another person was making fun of me. I said, went right back around. And I said, yeah, you know, this, this, this guy isn't that bad. It makes some kind of sense. And then I read. And, and then some of them become my biggest, quote unquote, fans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. I, uh, I understand that. Um, a parenthesis in the conversation real quick with Kubrick. I really like, I, I love Kubrick. Who, uh, what films do you think are, are the best Kubrick films? 2001 is his best film. And it's okay. arguably the greatest film ever. I, I just did a did a, a show. If you look on Cosmo, at the front page, I linked to this podcast I did with this fellow named Mike Lee. Okay. But, uh, the two greatest films that if I were to argue... Uh, that I think are, are the greatest are either 2001 A Space Odyssey or La Dolce Vita by Fellini. Uh, La Dolce Vita gets Mike's slight nod simply because, well, technically, no one ever did what Kubrick did and hasn't done in the almost, what, over 50, almost going on 60 years since. La Dolce Vita is one of those things that it's it's a perfect film. If, have you ever watched La Dolce Vita? Oh, okay. Uh, it, it, it's a great comedy. It's a great drama. It's a great musical in one scene. Marcello Mastroianni, one of the great actors, gives a titanic performance. It, it, it isn't necessarily a linear film, yet the symbol, it's Fellini's best film by far. One of my cats, actually, I named after Dolce, La Dolce Vita. Um, mm. And another great Fellini film, Cabiria, is my other cat, my two mm. little female cats, La Dolce and Cabiria. Um, but, uh, uh, those would be my two. Now, that doesn't mean, for example, there are other films that you could make arguments for. When I talk about, for example, objectivity and subjectivity, no one can really make an argument that 2001 is a bad film. You just can't. You yeah. may not like it. Mm -hmm. You may enjoy a schlock film like Plan 9 from Outer Space, which is technically science fiction, but it's yeah. not qualitatively. And I, I, I love Plan 9 from Outer Space. If you've ever seen it, it's a terrible film. It's so big, you know, props fall down and break, you know, and it, 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 it's ridiculously bad. Um, you, you may not like La Dolce Vita, but you can't argue it's a great, not a great film. You might say 2001 is better or La Dolce Vita is better. And that's arguable. That's where the subjectivity comes in. But when you, when you look at a bad piece of artwork, and you look at a good piece of artwork, whether it's film, poetry, uh, a, a dancer, or whatnot, right. um, there, there's going, there's usually going to be one who's significantly better. I'm not, I don't, I don't, for example, have the ability to tell you that necessarily uh, who's better in two grand top ballerinas. But I, but I can look at a mediocre dancer and say she's not as good as the the, the top ballerina. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, an example. And, and, and also think about this too. If you don't do that and everything is subjective, you're denying the, the quality and the hard work that the person who went and made that great thing put into it. Imagine you, it takes five years to make a film and you scrap together for money or whatnot. And you, you, you do like Orson Welles did and you have, you have to get $5,000 here, 10000 and it's your first film. 
and 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 you 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 get it finally into some uh you know Sundance Film Festival, and it becomes. It becomes a hit, and you get a little bit of a name or whatnot. Now, now someone someone can say they didn't, didn't think it's a good film or whatnot. That that's fine. There are bad critics here or there, but if you don't acknowledge that that there's some qualitative judgment that's being brought to it, why the fuck do anything? Because if if all if all art does is exist so that you can feel good about yourself, well, you know, uh, get a vacuum cleaner. Put it to your dick and just give yourself a blowjob all day. Right. Yeah. Uh, an example that you gave once that that is in tune with what you're saying is that you like a Godzilla movie, an old Godzilla movie, mm. but you no, know, you know it's a bad movie, but you like it. Well, the original Godzilla is a good uh, monster movie, and there's a film, the the uh, what is it, uh, Godzilla's Revenge, which is a mishmash of of some of the worst Godzilla movies. That's actually put into service of something pretty good, and it's a pretty and it's a good and I would argue even a great kids film. It's not great cinema, but right. it's a great kids film. And this is where genres come in. Something can be a great science fiction film, but maybe just a mediocre film. I you know or, or uh, you know it's like it's like you can have if if you're lo listening to a trite bad pop song, but it has one of the great guitar solos. You could say, well, that's still a worthy piece of music. The the lyrics are shit. The 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 melody is shit. But it's got that great guitar solo. So that makes that worthwhile to you to listen to it. Right, right. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about is your drive. How, where do you think your drive to create comes from? Because I'm amazed at how much work you produced. That goes back to my childhood. I I I told you I grew up. If you ever saw the movie Goodfellas, yeah, I grew up in that kind of neighborhood. Now that's probably not as bad as with the cartels in Mexico in uh, right for in, in terms. But it, it it's the closest analog. When you when you live your life in fear and people are constantly putting it out, uh, I I there would be uh, you know people in the the first neighborhood I grew up in. Uh, that that would you little faggot, you four-eyed piece of shit, you you know you this that or the other thing. Uh, girls would make fun of you, you know. Uh, bit, the bullies would beat you up. Uh, you you know you you'd get shat upon by the gangsters who ran everything, or you'd see the cops would come along. I, I I've written about it. Like I remember, remember cops would stop me and my my friends when we're six and seven years old uh, uh, to ask us because they knew that the gangsters used kids to transport. Uh, drugs or whatever, it, whatnot. I remember one time they had us up against the wall like we were criminals and they pulled our shorts down and my little friend, they, they like took the, their, their baton and they fucking went between diddling his balls. The, the, guy, the kid was like five or six years old and he was a fat little rotund kid and you know they did the same to me. I, I had the wherewithal to not, to slough it off and not get destroyed by it. I, I, I don't know whatever became of him in that sense. There are people, there are people, my wife is one of them, she can be destroyed by uh, something negative someone says, and she'll ask, why don't you care about, why don't you care about wearing something, you know, why are you just wearing this white shirt when you're being talking with someone online, I don't give a shit, what, you know, what am I going to do, put on a fucking tuxedo, that's going <laughs> to make, make what I say any more cogent or intelligent, no, but some people get into that, you know, uh, uh, and it's a lot of women, female artists too. They always have to put their photos up. You know, how many times can I tell you, honey, that you're gorgeous and you're still, still insecure? You're the most gorgeous creature that ever walked the planet. But, but I need to hear uh, my poem. It's a relax. You know, or they'll talk about you know my uncle or the priest molested me with, when I'm seven. I'm forty seven. Forty years later, you're letting some deviant motherfucker who who touched you as a child ruin your life. Get over it. Now, I know that there are people that don't have the ability to do that, but you have to fucking try. If I, if I categorize, catalog every fucking bad thing from abuse to, to being beaten up, to being stabbed, to being shot at, to, to being this, that, or the other, everything bad in my life, every time a woman told me, fuck off, asshole, you know, what am I going to do, quiver? You got to keep going on. You only have a certain amount of time. None of us are immortal. 50 years from now, I'll likely be dead. I, I don't think I'm going to make it to 108, but I'm going to try for 100. But I don't think I'm going to make it to 108. If I do, because I'm 58 now, if I do, that's good. But hopefully I'll still have a good mind and not just be a vegetable in a chair, you know, sucking on baby food. 
Right. So, so you think your drive comes from your childhood? Yeah. It, 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 when people try to press you down, you either get crushed or you become a diamond. And I'm, I'm more the diamond type. If you ever read James Baldwin, he is too. Now, I don't, I, I'm, I'm white and I'm male, so I, I didn't have to deal with sexism or the racism of this society, but I grew up poor. I worked for 40 fucking years in corporate America. I worked for gangsters before that. I'll take the gangsters in one in one sense because at least they were they they tell you you know no one cares about it. corporate America they're they're motherfuckers. I think it's amazing how despite having to work full time, you still manage to produce so much great work. You make more more work than full time writers. You but. have to you have to make it your priority. I've told Jessica this time. She does her exercise in the morning, goes to work, and she's tired. And I said, I said, why? You know, you're you're forty six years old. She's a she's an attractive woman, but you're you're not going to look like you're twenty five anymore. I'm not saying you let yourself get get big and fat, uh, but uh, you know. You know, I, I've got in, in my foot here, I've got plantar fasciitis. So I, I, I sometimes I've been limping around. I, I've been going to a doctor again. I've had that for 16 years. I, ha I had I had uh, one time when I tried to expose a drug dealer. I, I was tackled uh, and it, it jammed my knee for 20 years. I had a limp there too. You know, I mean, I, I've got my, my elbow here. I've got a pulled ligament or something. I've, I've got 10 days off coming next month. Hopefully I'll get that healed. I, I usually wear sometimes an so one of these icy things, you put it in the freezer and then you put the sleeve on to ice it. You know, until I until I retire, you know, in seven or nine years, whatever it's going to be, you know, I'm just going to have to deal with the pain. I've dealt with pain before. I've worked with broken bones or whatnot. It's part of doing physical labor. Yes, I'd like, you know, if you've got a million dollars, a couple of million dollars you want to share with me, that's fine. I'll retire and I, I'll show you. I, I'll do more. I'm not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sit on my ass, you know, and, and go go, you know, traveling the world. I, I do these interviews with, with a lot of people, a lot of them academics. It amazes me. These people, they write one book every seven or eight years. They take off a sabbatical. How many times I've contacted them in just the last week or so? You know, oh, uh, I'm traveling through Italy for the next three three weeks, you know. Uh, I, I won't be back to, to do a show or whatnot. Uh, and it's like, you don't have a computer with you? Who doesn't take their computer with them when they travel? You could do an interview, but no, they they want to fulfill it. You know, an artist has to travel, and and and, and when it gets back to what I was talking about, the top of Everest, it's like, look, I if 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 the French government wanted to fly me over and, and, and give me a medal as, as a great poet or whatnot, I'd say, okay, but I don't need to see the fucking Eiffel Tower. I've seen pictures of it. I can imagine it. I can imagine what it smells like, rusting iron. I can imagine what it looks like. I can imagine looking up and getting a, a pigeon shit on my face, you know? So do you write every single day? Yeah. Uh, I mean, today I didn't because I had to do some work outside and then I had to do some stuff. But like I said, I started about a week or so ago, I started this play on uh, Justinian and the whale Porphyrios. And... Uh, I, 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 I took about a, a week to put it together because I've been editing this Bruce Ariel books. And so I'll, I'll be finished either tomorrow or Saturday. And then, you know, I'll, I'll, I've got a list of seven or eight other play ideas that I'll do. And, you know, I finished this book called Center of Mass, which is about uh, uh, World War II and uh, the people who came home and their basic, uh, basically it's about, I guess you call it post-traumatic stress disorder and how it, affects a lot of different people in different ways, some people more than others. Um, and and I, I, I was going to do a, a World War II book, but then I was like, you know, do I really need, do, we, do the world really need another World War II book that has characters in a battle? I could do that. I did portions of that are in my books, The Vincetti Brothers and A Norwegian in the Family. So as I'm writing it, I, I'll, I'll start off with an idea, but I usually get better ideas as I go on. And uh, have you read, James, you've read James Joyce's Dubliners? Have you read that? No. Okay. The last the last story in that fifteen story collection is called The Dead. And it ends with one of the most famous scenes in English language literature with snow just falling all over Ireland. And that's the way you have to be with it. You know, if I can show you, you know, uh, there you can see books and that, that pile by that light there. That's where I have all my play ideas and book ideas. I mean, I, the next novel that I get a chance to do is probably going to be a novel. Uh, uh, 
on this uh, professional wrestler called the superstar Billy Graham in the 1970s. Uh, wow. So I'll go back between these high, big novels and smaller, little novels and whatnot. But, you know, I, I, things come to me. Um, I, I still need to do a third play in my musical. I've done two musical plays. Uh, I do need to do a third one to finish that little trilogy. And I, I have another cup, another series where I've done two of the four. But that take, I, I, because you keep things coming up, I, I don't have to force it. So sometimes I'll, I'll have something for two or three years. It took me 20 years to get the idea for the Vincetti brothers. In the early 90s, I wanted to write about these kids that I knew growing up. I felt about doing poems about them, but it wasn't until I saw this movie called Rocco and His Brothers, an Italian movie by Luchino Visconti in like 1960, which was a, a melodrama. that I said, that's the, that's the way to do it. That film gave me the in to doing the Vincetti Brothers. And when I finished the Vincetti Brothers, I said, you know, this is the best novel anyone's ever written. Then I wrote better novels. Do you, when you write, do you type or do you write by hand? When I did poetry, I did poetry by hand. I haven't written poetry since 05. Uh, I'll, hopefully I'll get back to it after I retire. I, I just find I, I need to be focused uh, going back and forth. Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to give as much time to poetry as I need it. And I, I've done a ton of poetry, so I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about not having enough great poetry. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I... I, I just keep doing as things come. I, I let the snow keep falling and I write ideas on, on post-its here. I've got, you know, post-its of, of this, of everything. Yeah, I, I, my, my mind is very fleeting. Things come in and out of it uh, very quickly. Um, so. so so you would say, just to summarize this, um, to, to be a good writer, to write good, you have to make it your priority. Yes. You, I mean, you, you don't get great at something doing not, it part-time. Yeah. It's bullshit what, if you've ever seen online, they talk about, you know, anyone can become great at something by spending 10,000 hours doing it. No, no, that is an absolute lie. If you don't have the fundamental ability to do something, you could spend an, an infinite amount of time, you're not gonna be great. Right. I'm not, go I'm not going to ever be a great singer. I don't have the vocal ability. I don't have it. My brain doesn't connect to the, the vocal cords. I, I can't be a great singer. Right. Um, and I've seen some one of two of the most tragic things you're going to see artistically are people who have talent, like some of these uh, the couple of these women I mentioned, and then they they fuck around because their emotions get away. And the other thing is people who have no talent who just persist. And this is why you need to have good ne negative criticism to so say stop wasting your time. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's crazy, but you're right. You're right. Um, do you have an idea of how you would like your books published um, if, if, if you had the opportunity? I mean, in, in turn, I would be the editor. I would let someone do, uh, you know, spell check and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, proofreading, but no one's going to change. The, I mean, right. something like a Norwegian in the family, I, I have broken in, into some sometimes two columns on a page and I want the word there. What it is in the word document is exactly how it should appear. As far as publishing, if a, if, if a publishing house, if, if American publishing houses cared about literature and culture, they would look online for great writers. Somehow they would have found Cosmoetica and they yeah. would have looked at it and they said, you know, this guy's, uh, this guy's an arrogant asshole, but he writes pretty good. So maybe we should publish a poem of his. It's not arrogant, number one, if you're just talking about it. I don't go around at work, you know, uh, I'm uh, unloading a truck. I say to the truck guy, hey, did you know that I'm a great writer? You'd be like, what does that, you know, pull the fucking thing out. It, it has nothing to do with, with, with how I make a living. But, you know, someone like Alex Sheremet is, is hopefully, he has ideas of starting a press. And maybe next year we're going to try to to release this Bruce Arias books under his imprint, but... We'll see. Yeah. I, I I don't expect it, this is a thing that's going to be several decade project to, to get along. Uh, I have a friend who's a, a professor who is hoping would be able to get Bruce's stuff in a in a, uh, uh, a university so that they could store his stuff. This is this is a guy who wrote a great a great novel and also wrote over sixty great poems. 
as a mentally ill man, a man who who was living homeless for years ago and who, you know, once was running naked through a city. Uh, and yet he turned his life around and he became a great writer. Uh, I mean, I played a, a part in that, but he did he did the hard work. And this is the kind of story that if you want a, a feel good story, uh, putting aside the quality of his writing, but if you want a feel good story, this is a guy who is at the bottom of society, sleeping on grates, sleeping in the streets. And yet he turned his life around and cr added great literature that the vast majority of these these fuckers from the last 40 years in the MFA mills of the United States, they don't have, you know, he's only got one great novel. He A lot of the rest of his stuff is bad, but that one great novel is better than than all but maybe one or two books that have been published in the last 40 years in this fucking country. Hopefully it's a little bit better in Mexico. I don't know. Uh, probably not. Um, yeah, because probably most publishers... They're going to want to edit everything, right? Most publishers. Well, when I'm dead, you know, they're not they're not going to edit. They, you, you know, uh, yeah. the only yeah. thing that I would allow being edited out is some things that that, uh, uh, for example, in some of my books, Norwegian the Family, I quote some song lyrics. But that's easy. You know, you you just said, uh, you, you know, you just put uh, lyrics for this. What would be here? Uh, you know, will be public domain in seventy two years or whatever it might be. You know. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I, I agree. No one should edit. I mean, who's going to edit your work better than you? Well, look, film and literature are the only two art forms that people who are not creative fuck up. Mm. You know, no one, you know, I don't, abstract expressionism is one of the great frauds uh, artistically, but mm. no one ever came to, to look at a Pollock piece of shit with most of his stuff is pieces of shit and, and fucked it up. You know, uh, it's it's amazing how and and there are but there are cases where their writers didn't know what they had. Uh, Time in the River uh, by uh, and uh, the other book. Uh, there's a, a oh god, uh, I forget the name. There was a, a Thomas Wolfe, uh, a well-known writer back in the 1930s, uh, and he he like David like David Foster Wallace. He had you know a you know a huge manuscript of stuff where he's just going up. But the editors there knew how to make it into something quality. They didn't. They didn't. <laughs> they couldn't do it with Foster Wallace because I don't think the quality was there. But even if you had, even if you had good, so even if you had good editors, they wouldn't make much of it. But they were bad editors there, you know. So you had bad writing and bad editing. And this is one of the things: is when you when you reward badness, lack of quality, it only brings more because. I'm a bad writer. I, I don't have real talent, but I see, you know, that guy who wrote that novel, I could write that shit. And oftentimes you could write it. Bad writers can, can equal the bad work of others. So they get this delusion that that must be good. You don't know how many times online I, I've seen arguments. Alex and I did this show about a year ago about this guy named Christopher Langan and Jordan Peterson, if you've ever heard of Christopher Langan, the guy who has supposedly a 200 plus IQ. And he, he's got this ridiculous science, quasi-scientific, pseudo-scientific idea about the universe. And yet it, it's nothing new. It's terribly written. And this is the kind of stuff. But people on, on YouTube will be like, yeah, but he's got a 200 IQ. The only reason these people think anything of this guy's idiocy is because he, had a, a, he took a test for a 200 IQ. They have no ability to discern the quality or lack thereof of his ideas. They just see this fucking number that has been uh, normalized and been put up there as, as something stating that this guy must be smart because he was able to do, I don't know if you've ever taken an IQ test. They're basically retard tests. You know, yeah. I, 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 when I took one for, because my cousin asked me to, I could have gotten 100 I, out of 100. You know, it was like 150 questions. I could have gotten them all right. But there were questions that I, dis that I disagreed with the premise of. So if I know that the, the questions themselves are faulty, I don't get any credit for that. Not that I wanted any credit, but the whole idea is people look to people and authority. People are monkeys. They just want to go with, with, with authority. You know, uh, if, if David Foster Wallace, who, who, who got this fame, had said, you know, I'm really a fraud, but 
There's this guy named Schneider with Cosmoetica. He's the real deal. All of you people who suck my dick should go over and suck Dan's dick. I probably have I probably have a book deal because of that. Uh, but you know, so this is the crazy way that people uh, view art. It, it becomes nothing but a, a, a circle jerk, a daisy chain of, of people doing favors for each other. And you, you know, because because I was a professor and literally one of my female students blew me. I'm going to give her a recommendation, you know, uh, well, I'm going to say that she should win this prize if I'm on that prize committee to, to publish this book. That's the way art is. This is the same way that the gallery system works. This is the same. I've, I've interviewed filmmakers who talk about how terrible you can't, if you're a, a filmmaker of some quality, you're not going to get into the Sundance Film Festival. All of those Sundance films, 99, out of 100 films there, maybe one or two is one of those independent guys. Most of the rest of that are, are little small uh, studio uh, films that are, are put out under a different uh, imprint. You know, so they're not really independent films. Um, I wanted to ask you about a specific director who I personally think used to be good, but his last movies have been shit. But I really want to know what you think. What do you have? No, no, no. It's Quentin Tarantino. Uh. What do you, what do you think of, of him? So I saw, I saw the Reservoir Dogs. That was a good, solid film. Pulp Fiction was a good film. Jackie Brown was probably the best film of his I saw. Then I saw Kill Bill one and two. Mm -hmm. um, there's one other one that I saw that I'm probably Inglorious Bastards. No, I didn't. I I seen part. The the thing with him, he's sort of like the guy who did Batman and then the 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 night before Christmas. What's his name? Um, Tim Burton. Yeah, Tim Burton. These are these guys are both juvenile. How? I mean, I think I think uh, Tarantino's four or five years older than me, so he's a senior citizen now. He's sixty two, sixty three years old. Why is why is he still doing these juvenile kung fu homages or whatnot? It's like grow up. Jackie Brown, I said, was the best film of it. It's within that milieu that he works, but, but there were two mature characters having a romance, an interracial romance. There was there was some depth there. Now, Jackie Brown, I don't think is really a great film, but it's, I think, easily Tarantino's best film that I've seen. Um, uh, Steven Spielberg, again, is another one of these Peter Pan guys. It's like everything is juvenile to him. Um, why? Uh, if you watch a film like films from John Cassavetes, that those are adult films, not in the porno sense, but that that they, you know, they're dealing with with topics of depth that adults should be dealing with, um, and it, it's terrible that it's not, and it's terrible that someone like Tarantino, uh, you know, who clearly has talent, Spike Lee's another guy, Spike Lee has talent, but his films are all paper thin, the characters are nothing but cliches. Just because he's black, we're not going to say a cliche is a cliche. The best films that he did, Spike Lee, are a couple of his documentaries. He did a documentary about the four little black girls who were blown up in Selma, Alabama during the civil rights movement here in the U.S. in the 1960s. That's a good film. Um, probably his best, uh, his best uh, 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 fiction film uh, is probably the Malcolm X film. But even that one, he had to interject himself into it. Um, you know, it's like when I, I've talked to people, too, about Alfred Hitchcock. Hitchcock, you know, uh, you can't compare Hitchcock to Fellini or Kubrick. Hitchcock made popcorn movies. Then they're not deep. The characters are paper thin. Um, don't, you know, and people will say, yeah, but you have to have some entertainment. Yes, but it doesn't have to be 99.9% .9 entertainment. You know, <clears throat> I'm 58 years old. You know, do I really want to see comic books? What kind of people, you know... Where I work at a supermarket, uh, we sell Mattel cars, little little toy cars, you know, that are about this big, maybe. You know, mm -hmm. you know who buys them? Forty year old incels. <laughs> These fucking guys who've never who've never you know tasted a woman's pussy, or another guy's dick if they're gay. It doesn't matter to me. These guys who sit around whacking off. You play. You you're buying cars. You're fascinated by little plastic and cars. Same thing with comic books. How the hell can you be a 40-year-old man and be interested? Well, you know, Batman could never beat Spawn. 
The Hulk would kick the hell out of Superman. Who gives a fuck? This is art that needs pictures. And I'm not starting to say that there aren't good comic books, but most of the comic books that people brew it as great, like The Watchmen, you know, are mediocre. You know, I think, I think what was it, The Dark Knight Returns, I had that. I used to work 30 years ago at a magazine warehouse, and so we'd be able to pick some stuff for free. What? And so I picked some of the comic books that were good, thinking maybe they might be worth something someday. But, uh, uh, but you know, how many times can you watch Batman movie? You know, his parents died. Get over it! Superman. Superman's planet exploded. But you're, you're a demigod in your world. What, what, what possible fast? Superman can go as fast as the Flash almost. He could, he could stop crime before it happens. He could go back in time. As, what, what, what real drama is there? You know, th these are juvenile fantasies, and they're not like the Greek gods. They're not like the 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 Norse gods. They're not like the Chinese or the 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 the, the Mesopotamian gods. Those were people that. These, those were creatures or ideas that people actually thought were real. We know Superman is a fiction. We know Batman is a fiction. How are you so entertained by this? How can you be 40 or 50 years old and not want to uh, watch uh, entertainment for someone like Andre Tarkovsky or someone like Bella Tarr or someone like Teo Angelopoulos or here uh, Nuri Bilge the the Turkish film director who's Arguably, I would say, the greatest living film director that we have in this world. Do, do you think, and I think I know the answer, are, are the arts, like, like movies and, and literature, is it getting worse in terms, of, in terms of publishing and all that? Yes, yes. And it started around 1980 when Ronald Reagan got elected president here in the U.S. He dumbed down everything. These right-wing Republicans are so fucking stupid that, you, you know, music... The 80s saw synthesized music, and it's gotten worse since then. Uh, songs, uh, there's a fellow named Rick Beato. Have you ever seen his website? Yeah, yeah. he does some interesting stuff. I think, he, I, I think he sometimes does fluff just to get hits to make money, which I, I, I'll grant him. But he does do, you know, I'd say a third of his videos are, are very well into There's another kid named David Bennett in England who analyzes songs. He's pretty good. There's a guy... Uh, a guy named Phil who, who does Wings of Pegasus. This is a good channel. He he analyzes people's performances and, says, and talks about their guitar playing. Uh, Wings of Pegasus, David Bennett, and, Dave, and, and Rick Beato are probably the three best YouTube music sites that I found. So if you're interested in music and you want to pursue that, go there. If you, if you, you seem to know a couple of them. But now what was I saying? I forgot. Uh, Oh yeah, I, I asked if if it's getting worse. Oh yeah, it it, it it it's getting worse. Yeah, you, know, you know, all of these young writers that that are in the cosmoetica, auto machination now circle. Auto machination is the sort of if if I'm the granddaddy with cosmoetica, Alex is now the father with auto machination. Um, yeah. In that circle, uh, you know, there's a dozen or so young people with talent. You would, I would have hoped, twenty years on, I would have had maybe a couple of hundred, you know. Um, but I can't compete with YouTube. I I can put this on the whatever two three hours we do, and and I break it up into little video pieces that I can put on, um, and maybe you know a year from now so another young fellow contacts me. Um, but, you know, I, I can't go against the, the whole weight of a, a culture that is just frivolous and childish and, and, and doesn't care about being ch frivolous and childish. It's the same reason we have a global warming. People don't, they don't want to think about things. You know, some, the, I, I, I'll vote for Trump, I'll vote for Biden, he'll do something. No, they're just going to fuck, fuck around. I'm sure, I'm sure the leaders of Mexico are just as disliked as here in the U.S. But people don't do anything. It, it is the fault of the public because we don't vote for, for third parties here in America. At least you have third parties, I think, in Mexico. We don't have, it's just the fucking Republicans and Democrats. The Democrats are right-wing assholes and the Republicans are full-out fascists. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And they are fascists. They, they, they act like black shirts. Yeah, you know, uh, here, you know, we have the debt ceiling crisis, which isn't really a crisis. It, 
But but what do the Republicans want to do? They want to cut social services because poor and sick and old people should just fucking die. That's the way they think about it here. I recently read one of the worst books that I've ever read in my life, a novel. And on the back of the novel, there is at least five quotes from the New York Times or from other publications saying it's one of the best books ever written. Mm-hmm. And that's when, I re- that's when I realized I was like, there's something wrong. Because it's what, one of the worst book? books. What book? Uh, you know the author, Donna Tart? I, I've heard of her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the Secret History, which was good. I liked it. But the second book, it's called The Little Friend. One of the worst books I've ever read in my entire life. I was angry after I read it. I was like, she wasted my time. Mm. I, and I've, n- I've never been angry after reading and something. And that, that's a good emotion to have. Because this is one of the things I've said. As an artist... I always have to keep in mind that there's someone there that I'm communicating to. I have to give something so that you give your attention to me. Now, that doesn't mean that everything that I'm going to do is going to thrill you. Like I said, you might, out of some of these books, you might say, yeah, yeah, that that science fiction book that you did, Dan, I, I, I thought it was a terrific book, but I just, you know, I just couldn't get into it. That's a perfectly valid response to have. But saying that I hate a book because, because it, it, the, the characters are, are too racist or the characters this or, or the, the plot doesn't go the way you thought it was going to go. Uh, and then saying that that's somehow bad it, is not. It, it again gets back to the difference between bad criticism uh, being uh, can be good or uh, negative or positive or good criticism can be negative or positive. They're different things and most people can't make those fine uh, granular differences, you know, they, they, they want to wipe with a, a broad brush. Yeah. It's I, easy. Yeah. I, I was, I was angry cause I was like, I, I could have read a, a Charles Dickens book or I could have read a Dan Schneider book instead of this, you know? Mm. Um, and, and also it's, it, it's also with Stephen King. Like, uh, you go to, when you're in the airport, you go to the bookstores there and they're promoting just the worst books. They're promoting Stephen King books. And oh yeah, saw- and, and and there are there are people worse than Stephen King. You know, and, and, and if you look for if you go in bookstores, if hopefully you have some bookstores down in Mexico. Uh, hopefully it hasn't become like the U.S. where there, there are very few uh, private bookstores. But all you see, for example, if you science fiction, you you see very few little of the classic science fiction, which you need to read. But you you see all of these things with you know uh, either they are like Star Wars with princesses and and yeah. riding you know weird animals on the cover, or they're books where you have some fucking nerd uh, who who's so uh, his, his worldview or, or whatnot this world building bullshit uh, you know <laughs> the the world that they build is so fucking inane and so fucking solipsistic that it's like, what? You know, again, you have to account for the audience. I said, for example, my last, this play that I'm going to finish in a day or two, I had to make it a comedy, you know, uh, because a whale, a whale attacking a nation 1500 years ago and basically terrorizing the nation, one of the most powerful nations on earth during that day, the, the, Eastern Roman Empire, it, you know, how could I make that really dramatic? I mean, uh, you know, it, there has to be farcical. And so what I did was I made up a character that's the manservant of the emperor, and the man, the manservant is kind of snarky and knows that, and uh, the, their relationship is, is funny, and he keeps interrupting things as if he's running the palace. So by making that that way, it makes the story of a whale terrorizing this a little bit more palatable because you see that. The bureaucrats then were still idiots. Um, what are your thoughts? Have you read a- Ayn Rand? Oh, God, yes. Terrible, <laughs> terrible writer. Now, for, forget about the fact that she was a total fraud and, 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 and she, she was a hypocrite and she was a bigot. Uh, her writing is terrible. Even if she was the most wonderful person, it's leaden. You know, it's like wearing it's like wearing boots filled with lead and trying to run up a hill. I mean, it's terrible. Her writing is terrible. She has no music. She has no insight. Her writing is, is she's one of the worst, just technically worst writers you're going to ever find. 
Forget about her philosophy, which is terrible too. But the writing is uh, is atrocious. But she's got a cult. I describe it as as cold. Is that a good way to describe the way she writes? Like, uh, yeah, I mean, co- I mean, it, it, there's a, a coldness. The, the 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 world that she paints uh, in her books uh, is there, there's no sense. There's no sense that she really understands the way human beings operate. Uh, yeah. her, her characters are this, are. are this, stereotypes yeah i read i read the fountainhead which i i really did not uh like much and i thought as shrugged was better mm. I, I wanted to know what you thought because i don't uh, remember it's been 30 years since i read both of them i both of them are bad that one is slightly better than the other who gives a shit you know <laughs> you know my, your, your shit is sli- smells slightly better than mine what does it matter yeah um Okay, well, that, I mean, that I can think of right now, those are all the questions that, that I had. Okay. Um, but this was good. Do you think this was a good a good talk? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll always be, you know, willing to talk uh, about things, you know. Um, like I said, uh, there's so many... It, the people who should be the custodians of culture and take a pride in this don't. They don't. The artists that have real talent find ways to sabotage themselves. Oh, Dolce! Here, here's, my, here's my cat Dolce that I mentioned. Give her some time. I don't think she's ever been... A, here's Dolce. She's the smartest. She's the girl. Whenever I bring home groceries, uh, she, she's inspecting to make sure everything's okay. She's a protector at night. She, she wanders the halls. She, any intruders have to deal with you. Is Dolce theirs or none? I... Here's Dolce. Oh, Jessica's just coming home. You can meet Jessica here. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, uh, you know, like I said, I would let me let me put you on my my e list here, uh, so that you can maybe uh, uh, interact more with people like Alex and and Zeke and yeah, some of these other people because I would you, love you, it. you said you contacted Alex about what? He he sent me an email. Oh. He said introducing himself and just uh, showing me a few videos that he's done, and um, yeah, I wrote him back and and he seems like a cool, really cool dude. And his website, I've been on his website. I think it's it's great. You know, there's a lot of good writing on it. 